but I just don't do it often enough. So we wanted to put together a panel of these amazing photographers that do this for a living every day to give us tips on how to make dynamic landscape pictures, whether you're traveling throughout this country or world or in your own backyard. So we have three killer panelists to talk about the work they do and some of the tips in making great landscape. Let me start off by introducing a real cool cat, Joshua Cripps, to the Nikon Theater stage. <laughs> And I used to mispronounce her name so often, but I've got it down now because we've known each other for several years. And I am just in love with the kind of life she is living, and I wish I could live that kind of life once I move past this career at Nikon. Mandy Lee, let me introduce you to the Nikon stage. And then this next dude, <laughs> oh man. I've been following his work for quite a while. And, and I say this of all the panelists, it's like I'm looking at eye candy. It's like a big rush. I, you know, I think every one of us should start our day by looking at a beautiful landscape picture because what that does is it gets me charged, gets me going to see that color, the beauty, the detail. Let me introduce to the Nikon Theater stage, Mike Mezuel the second. Yeah. Mike likes to fly in helicopters over active volcanoes <laughs> in some of the landscape work he does, and I think we're going to see some of those pictures yep. in this show. Wow, thank you guys for coming, thank you guys for sitting, and thank you guys for tuning in. Um, this is great. This is the 10th of 10 panel discussions we've had, and we've talked about everything from conservation in landscape uh, and, and wildlife to rock and roll about what it was like you know, shooting 30 years ago as opposed to now. But this landscape panel charges me up quite a bit because in the landscape world, whether you're shooting in color or black and white, you're either talking about incredible tonality or you're talking about just rich, beautiful colors and how those colors attract us when we look at them and the, the emotion that is evoked. And I want to delve into a lot of what you do on a daily basis, some of the tips that you have for everybody out there in becoming better landscape picture, uh, photographers and making more dynamic uh, landscape photos. So I'd like to start by introducing each of you. We're going to start with you, Josh, work our way in. Give everybody a little insight on how you got into photography, take your time, and um, what it is that, that fuels that passion for wanting to be a landscape photographer. Sure. So uh, I was born in, uh, in California, and I grew up in the forest. And I thought this was a very normal, natural thing until I went to Los Angeles to study engineering in college. And I realized there weren't any trees, there weren't any mountains. <laughs> and I was sort of shocked by this. And so that's what got me started, wanting to get back into nature and spending more time outside, specifically camping and backpacking. And the photography came much later. After I got my engineering degree, I was totally burned out on college, and I decided to do a big round-the-world trip. And so I took off for 18 months, and I was having these incredibly formative, powerful experiences in all these different countries around the world. And I was completely incapable of sharing those experiences with my friends and family back home. I had a little point-and-shoot camera with me, but I didn't know how to use it. I was a terrible writer. And it really grieved me that I couldn't tell people back home what I was experiencing in those countries. And I thought, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so I got a camera. Uh, when I finished that trip, I, I came back. I got a job as an engineer doing satellite design for, uh, for Boeing. And I bought a camera and just to go on vacations with me. And I made a classic beginner's mistake. I've got this really nice camera. I'm going on these vacations to these beautiful places, to Alaska, to New Zealand. But the photos I was coming home with were terrible. And all of a sudden, I realized this is a problem that I need to solve. The engineering mind kicks in. And I said, well, why would I need to choose this aperture versus that aperture, or this shutter speed versus that one? Why does right. this composition work and that one doesn't? And as I started to learn that, photography became a lot more fun. And then it became this all-consuming passion. And I quit my job as an engineer and jumped in to full-time landscape photography about 10 years ago. It sounds like a big leap, I mean, from a steady paying job to, to going out and making landscape pictures. That's pretty wild. Mandy, talk a little bit about how this got started. Where, where did that first camera come from, the first time you picked up a camera, when that passion really kicked in for running around the country the way you do, around the world yeah, the way you do? Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, the photography began before the running around the country. Um, I've actually, my first job when I was 16 was working in a camera store um, in a mall. 
Mm. And I literally have worked in camera stores for, God, I'm not that old, but it was like 17 years or something I spent in camera stores. And that whole time, I feel like I had the best teachers ever because I was always around photographers. It was a lot of um, just real life experience. And when I worked in Austin, I got to work around a lot of ambassadors for um, camera companies. And I just learned so much being around them. And finally, it was just, you know what? I'm done with the store thing. I'm, I'm doing it. I'm all in. And so I kind of got to grow up around the photography community. Landscape to me, though, I grew up in Colorado. And so I was always around mountains. My family, we always went camping as we were kids. And I think when you're young, something just gets instilled in you where you're raised. Like, there's a certain part of that that always sticks with you. So um, when it came to the type of photography I chose, I mean, nothing fired me up more than photographing a beautiful scene, you know? Very cool. Mike. Yes, sir. Where did it start with you? Uh, you know, when I was 15, I got my first camera. It was a film camera. And uh, I live in Texas. I grew up in Texas. So there really wasn't too much there to shoot. So I would shoot as much as I could locally. And then uh, I got my license when I was 16. It was kind of all downhill from there. I was like, all right, I've got this camera. I'm going to go travel around. I'm going to see the world, see everything I could. And uh, you know, traveling to these remote places and having that camera with me Kind of like Josh said, it's a great way to share uh, your vision and you know these experiences with others who may not be able to. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it was uh, you know getting that first camera, getting the driver's license, and then having no idea what to do but hit the road and go and find places that were beautiful to shoot. Mm -hmm. And then it gets really important because someone like me, um, I, I need to see that picture on the wall. I will not be at that place. I'm not saying I will never get there, but it's not my path in life. And I think it's so important that you guys spend that time traveling and, and, and getting to these different locations. And Mandy, you have a very special way of getting around. And we talked about this. I've asked you before, like, what is your home location? And there's no answer to that, right? How, how do you... Well, first of all, when did you really know that landscape was what you wanted to do? And how do you get to where you, you know, find these beautiful pictures? Um... The transition, so I live in a teardrop trailer, if you guys know what that is. It's basically a very tiny trailer um, shaped sort of like a teardrop. And I live in it full time with my boyfriend, so there's two of us in there. Um, and it's very unique because most people, even living full time on the road, are usually in a larger RV. So um, the transition was really to facilitate my photography. Mm -hmm. I was living in Texas and I knew I wanted to shoot landscape, but as Mike was saying, there's not really a ton of scenery in Texas. There is some, but um, so I just wanted a mode of transportation to get me to the places I wanted to be, which were usually pretty long drives. And it, the, the drives and the trips were so long and I realized the only time I was happy was when I was on one of these trips. And so I just sat down one day and I asked myself, why not? Why, why am I staying here in a town just because that's what society says I need to do? Why do I have to keep this career and live in an apartment? Why can't I live in my teardrop? Because it, it makes me happy. And I brought it up to my parents thinking they would freak out. And they were just like, Mandy, we never see you happier than when you're doing this. And That's huge. that was it. I was just like, okay. Mm -hmm. So so I went full time and and now I can get to locations. I can spend time in locations. I can explore locations. Cause it's hard to just show up on day one and just, you know, find the spots. Sometimes you have to spend some time there. I was gonna say, you know, one of the things I would think that if I was getting into landscape photography, uh, and I'm gonna turn this towards you, Josh, that you know, y you have to have a plan, right, or a thought. I mean, I could think of a million different places to go to take beautiful pictures because I've seen them, you know, hanging in galleries and, and always say, I've got to go to that place. How do you set yourself up, Josh, and, you know, push that passion and keep yourself going? How do you plot out going to your next location? So a lot of it for me, uh, it's building blocks, right? When you're starting out as a photographer, one of the first things you do is copy other photographers, and especially in landscape uh, because... There's one really big part of the equation that you can rule out, which is a location that you've seen a beautiful photo from. You know if you go to Tunnel View in Yosemite, or you know if you go to Delicate Arch, 
it's a really amazing location. So you don't have to worry about that. You can work, focus on honing your skills and, and understanding light and all your camera settings. And then the next step is when you want to start to express yourself creatively and personally, you have that jumping off point. Mm -hmm. So for example, my favorite area uh, in the entire world to photograph is the Sierra Nevada Mountains. That's what I'll be speaking about in my presentation. And that started because I went to Yosemite as a kid. Right. And then I said, well, OK, Yosemite Valley is beautiful, but what's over that next ridge? And I started getting a backpack on and hiking in. Well, what's over that next ridge? And farther and farther and farther. And as you develop that deeper relationship, you really set yourself up because you, it, it's like any relationship. You know how a landscape is going to react under right. certain conditions, just like you know how your partner would react to a certain thing that you do, right? Right. So you build this intuition of, of where you want to go based on, okay, it's monsoon thunderstorm season. I want to go to this place that I've scouted. And that's how you kind of set yourself up for mm -hmm. that success. I'm going to date myself because I used <laughs> to teach Nikon school and we traveled around. And in one section of the travel photography or landscape photography, we would highly recommend that somebody, if they were traveling, go into the hotel's gift shop. And in the hotel's gift shop, there would typically be a little rack, and you'd spin the rack, and there'd be about 60 to 100 postcards on there. And you'd pick through those postcards and say, oh, where is that hot spot? Where's the angle? Where's, the, where's that place? I, I'm pretty sure that there are not many postcard racks anymore. Uh, Mike, talk a little bit about the research, though, you may do on the web. Now that we have this World Wide Web, and all these places that you can research, what do you do to, to, to figure out where you're going to go next? Uh, you know, it's kind of like the postcard thing. You know, you could hop on Google, do an image search of a location that you want to check out. But, uh, you know, as Josh mentioned, you know, there's so many beautiful places out there, like Tunnel View, uh, that you could go to, and you're going to line up with 80 of your best friends. But, you know, to find those unique spots, it's you kind of use Google or Instagram or any social media channels to kind of get an idea of what the possibility is there, what the scene looks like there. Um, I spend hours upon hours on Google Earth dropping that little yellow guy in different spots just to see what something looks like there. Um, and then I'll use uh, apps like Photopills or the Photographer's Ephemeris to see how the light's going to work during the time of year that I'm there. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go there. But when I go there, it's not just spending you know, a day there. You know, I spend days there and I hike for hours looking for different areas because, yeah, you have your beautiful location, you have your stereotypical, you know, stand here scenic view shot. Right. And I like to branch out of that. I like to get lost. I'll set my GPS, say, hey, this is where I can park the car, and then I'll just wander. Right. And when you do let yourself be free like that, give yourself that, creati or that creative freedom to just wander around, mm -hmm. that's when you find those unique images and those unique compositions that you know, people are going to go, wow, where is that? And you could go, oh, that's 100 feet from this really touristy spot. You just have to get off the beaten path. Sure. Now, you guys do this for a living in a business. And I've often said to myself, uh, it doesn't really matter what you guys have photographed. I want to go to that place and photograph it so I can appreciate what I've done and, and, and have that hang on my wall. Um, Mandy, you and I talked about this a little bit. Uh, a lot of photographers hit the same exact spots, and we were actually shooting a video in Jackson Hole, Wyoming with uh, photographer Taylor Glenn, and we walked right into a spot that I would bet thousands of people stood in to make the same shot of the Tetons. How do you work on differenti differentiating yourself from these other photographers that may have shot the same picture? I think there's a couple parts to it. One part is when you're actually out there shooting, you're like I talked about earlier today, you're looking for shots that are not obvious, shots that are different, different ways you can compose or different elements you can include that other people may not have. Um, but the other thing is that every photographer has a very distinctive look. Like sometimes you can just look at my picture and be like, oh, that's a Mandy picture. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that comes in post-production. Um, you know, I. I'm not ever going to lie and say, oh, yeah, I shot it. It looked just like that. I do lots of post-production, and I think I have a particular style, and I might want to take this scene that, you know, we could all three stand and take the same composition, mm -hmm. but we're not going to edit them the same. Um, and, so. and, and I see that because I, I, I've sort of felt so dejected in landscape because I'll go out there, try to get out there at the right time of day. I'll shoot the picture, and I'm like, that doesn't look like your picture. Yeah. It doesn't look like Josh's picture. Where did Mike come from with that? Um, Josh, how do you push that? How do you, how do you become different as a landscape photographer, yet still produce that beautiful, impactful image? 
Well, first let me say that I think a big misconception is uh, that you're, when you're in the field with landscape photography that you're trying to create a beautiful picture right then and there, mm -hmm. uh, which is not really true. Uh, my approach is you're trying to get as good data as you possibly can, that good quality raw file that, like Mandy said, then you bring in, you kind of work it. You know, it's like um, the raw file, I heard this wonderful analogy, the raw file is like a score, a musical score, and the post-processing is the performance of that score. Um, so in terms of differentiating, that's certainly part of it. For me, a big thing is I, I'm, uh, it's actually boredom. So what happens, I think, for most people is you go out and you shoot the same things as a lot of people. You shoot the same things as your friend. You shoot big, fat, wide-angle, grand landscapes. And then all of a sudden, you wake up one day and you go, I don't want to do that anymore. That's, that's boring to me now. What can I do differently? Um, so for me, for example, the last few years, my 70 to 200 has become my favorite lens for shooting landscapes. Right. Because what it allows you to do is pick out, instead of this whole scene, like with a wide angle photo, what you do is you tell your viewers, this is everything I saw. Right. As soon as you take that telephoto, you pick out a little vignette and you say, hey, this is the tiny little piece of this whole scene that just, just I saw this. And it's sort of mysterious because there's all this, uh, you know, the viewer doesn't know what's going on around the outside of that photo. So you're isolating, you're taking this big vista and you're making people see what you want them to see. Yeah, exactly. This is a perfect example, Mike's shot that just faded off, this tight little telephoto shot of this one little vignette. Mm -hmm. So the viewer gets to create this beautiful story in their mind about what's going on, they're drawn in. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the ways I, I like to differentiate. Uh, Mike, talk a little bit yep. about what your process is here and how much post-production, but more so, I see the work that you do. It, there's a lot more realism in, say, the volcano work. It's not like you're going to be playing and changing things much. Yeah. What's your approach to all this? Um, I'm a little bit more old school. Uh, you know, I learned and grew up on film, so you didn't really have the capabilities that you have now in the digital age with Photoshop. And uh, so I'm old school. I still carry, carry around glass square filters with me. I sit wait perfectly for that, that you know, perfect moment to happen, um, I won't take a shot. I, th I think when I go out, if I'm not getting what I want, I won't take the shot at all. Um, I'm more of a quality over quantity photographer. I'll sit there and wait, and if it never happens, I'm not going to take the shot. Um, and if I do get something brilliant, like uh, I get an amazing sunrise or sunset or roar display or something like that, I want the viewer that when they look at my image to not go, oh, that's photoshopped. I want them to go, okay, you know, that, that looks like something that could really happen. And so my manipulation in Photoshop is really just kind of color correction and, you know, uh, you know, white balance, stuff like that, a little bit of contrast, dodging and burning, basically what you could do in the dark room. Um, and, you know, these cameras have great dynamic range, so I'll utilize that as well. But, um, you know, for me, I want to keep it a photograph. I don't want to keep it, or I don't want to turn it into digital art. Right. You know, I don't want to skew the mountains. I don't want to, you know, add things that weren't there. I want that moment that I saw with my eyes. I want the audience to be able to step in right there and go, we were with Mike. Right. Um, let's continue on that because I think it's important. Uh, filters. What filters are you guys bringing out? Josh and Mandy, what are you guys bringing out there? Um, I think the most important filters are going to be neutral density and polarizers mm -hmm. for most landscape photographers, whether they're the round ones, whether you've got square graduated filters, um, but they definitely help. I mean, especially if you're trying to do any kind of long exposures on water. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think that's like imp necessary to have in your bag for sure. Josh, do you use a split neutral density filter? And I do when I'm specifically shooting seascapes. Right. Uh, can, can we? Can, can we explain if there's somebody who doesn't understand what a split neutral density filter is, what that is? A absolutely. So a uh, split neutral density or a graduated neutral density filter is simply a filter that has, it's like sunglasses on the top of the filter and then it fades out towards clear. And there's no color to the filter, that's the neutral part. And what it allows you to do is block bright light from part of the frame, but allow the light from a darker part of the frame to shine through uninterrupted. And so if you're in a situation where you have a very, very bright sky and a dark foreground, you can use a split or a grad filter to block that sky and even out the exposure between the foreground and the sky. And this is really cool in landscape photography because it gives your photos the same quality of light as classical landscape paintings. 
And so if you're out there and you're wondering, why don't my photos look like these ones I've seen? Right. Probably it has to do with the quality of light and the grad filter is... Or how light splits the yeah. scene. It's not always even as the sun's coming up or coming down. Absolutely. I think it's pretty obvious, and, uh, but, but could be stated or should be stated that everything that you guys do has to really rely on a time of day when the sun is at a certain point. You mentioned apps before yeah. and how critical it is to possibly have an app these days that tells you where the sun's going to be, at what time, um, to, to make that happen. W Mandy, when are the best times of day to shoot? My favorite is sunrise. I mean, there isn't a, you know, sunrise or sunset is better or worse. It just depends on which sunrise. They're all different, every single one of them. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you're doing astrophotography, there's certain parts of the United States that are dark sky parks and they're deemed dark sky areas where they're, they're known to be darker without much light pollution. So obviously, if you're doing that, you want to get to one of those locations. But as far as straight up time of day, I, I love sunrise. And right before sunrise, really, like before the sun crests over, there's so much color. And every single one is different. Sunrises are like snowflakes, depending on where you are. But Mike, what about you, time of day? I'm the opposite of Mandy. I, I'm it, <laughs> early mornings, forget about it. Um, <laughs> sunset, I love sunset, night sky. Um, but I love the challenge of going out and shooting midday, you know, when yeah. that light isn't necessarily the best. But say, like, you have a great storm system moving through, and all of a sudden you've got really cool textures in the sky. Well, you know, you can go out and uh, maybe work on some black and white or some abstract or some long exposures, something to take um, that time of day and make something of it. So, mm -hmm. you know, every from about, like, you know, 9 a.m. after, I'm solid. Um, sunrises. It, it takes it takes a pretty good one to get him to crawl out of bed, but I'll Ken still go for that. Kendrick always tells me that sunrise is so beautiful, and he'd like to see more of them if only they weren't so early. Yeah, the exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, when 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 I went through this, everything was you know again film and in a dark room, and there were a lot of techniques in a dark room that we used to use. Let's shift gears a little bit, Josh, towards the cameras that we have today, where you have the ability to control what we call in our line picture control where you're setting different variables. Are you letting the camera do its thing, or do you go in and contour the color and the sharpening and the, 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 the white balance? How are you setting up your camera? And I want to hear from all of you on this. So my approach is uh, I want, when I'm in the field, I want to understand what my raw data is like. And for me, the way to do that is to use the flat picture control. Uh, and it produces the most boring picture when I'm out there actually. It's exactly the opposite of what most would think, right? You pump it right to vivid and make a beautiful picture, you go flat. Absolutely. And that's because it gives you the most accurate representation of your raw data. So you know if you're clipping highlights, you know if you're clipped your shadows, or if your RGB channels are getting, if you're oversaturated, things like that. Uh, so that's what I do in terms of the picture controls. But everything else is I control it in the moment. White balance, I'm trying to pick. Uh, I will often bracket white balances because you will, you'll see in a photo like this one, for example, if you use a very warm white balance, all the blue in the sky is going to be a different hue. Maybe it's going to make you see the scene in a different way, and you're going to compose it differently. Uh, so white balance I, I change, and then aperture, shutter speed, all that sort of stuff. It depends on my artistic intention and the photo that I'm trying to capture in the moment. Mandy, talk about how you're setting your cameras up. Um, I have found on every Nikon I've owned, the 810, the 850, I have it in the standard. I just leave it in the standard picture control. I shoot almost everything in RAW so that I can have that RAW data. Um, and the white balance, again, kind of like Josh, I, I change it with the moment depending on what I'm shooting. A lot of times, auto white balance is a really great place to start, and that works. If I'm trying to get something really specific, I like to go into the custom Kelvin and just set the number to whatever is, especially at night, I find um, auto doesn't work very well at night. So you usually have to set that custom yourself. But I like to control everything, because sometimes landscapes really confuse your camera. I'm always trying to tell people it can't meet, it doesn't know what to meter on. It doesn't know. It's not like shooting a model. Right. Um, so having control over everything is just the easiest way to do it. Mike, how are you setting your cameras up? I agree with Mandy and Josh, you know, uh, putting it on standard picture control. You get the most, you know, you get that data that you want to see. But um, a part of the fun with photography is, you know, taking control of the camera, utilizing everything, the shutter, the aperture, the ISO, setting the white balance, you know. 
for instance, uh, Aurora shots, I think it's so important to uh, use Kelvin for your white balance. Because if you go with an auto, like Mandy said, it, it has a really difficult time understanding what the correct color should be for the sky. And a lot of time when I'm teaching out there, we're doing Northern Lights photographs, you know, people will be like, oh, I'm not seeing the colors you're getting. Well, because you're on auto. If you go to Kelvin and you really cool that temperature down, those greens, those purples, those blues, they all start really popping. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, this is right in front of me. So uh, taking, uh, taking control of the camera in every which way possible. Also, uh, utilizing a fun feature, even for landscapes, is us utilizing the uh, multiple exposures right. that you could uh, shoot inside the camera. And I'll, I will switch off to like monochrome in my picture control if I do go out to shoot black and white, because I do like to see a little bit of a preview of what that image will look like in black and white. Because mm -hmm. if you shoot in color, you know, a, a good color photograph ne isn't necessarily a good black and white photograph, and vice versa. So having that ability to switch over to monochromatic get a preview of what it looks like in the camera, that's really, really beneficial. When you say Kelvin, uh, to those that may not know, what Kelvin temperature are you setting to get to that cooler point? Yeah, so Kelvin, think of it as like kind of like uh, Fahrenheit, you know, the, uh, the higher the temperature, the warmer it is. So the warmer tones you'll get, the more orange and red you'll get. The cooler the temperature, you'll get more of the blues and maybe the greens. So, um, you know, daylight I believe is like 56, 5800. So if I'm shooting a sunset, I'll keep it around there. But the moment I start going into twilight or into night sky photography, I'll cool that off. Drop so I'm getting down. a more accurate representation. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of times for me, I mean, and not doing what you guys do typically, like I would just jump to the tungsten mode if I wanted to cool it off. Or I'll turn it to the flash mode if I want to warm it up and add a little bit more saturation. But I will jump into picture control, and instead of going flat or going standard, I'll pop to vivid when I'm doing landscape, so my greens pop a little bit more. So I have a lot less to think about, because I don't spend a lot of time in Photoshop. And one of the things I discovered um, in our monochromatic mode, that I've actually created a way of shooting color pictures in the black and white mode, when you actually turn the toning on, so you have the different toning for you know, the, the browns and the ambers and the purples and the rosés. And maybe that's like a bad thing to say in front of you guys, <laughs> but I cheat it to try to create something that looks normal if it just doesn't exist. You know, I see these beautiful pictures, and I'm sure there's probably quite a few you throw away that don't have the puffy clouds where the wind is blowing, there's no perfect reflection. So you try to make something happen on the fly. And if this is a technique I'm teaching you right now, go out and try it, because shooting in black and white and toning to colors makes some pretty brilliant pictures. To me, I would just take it to the point where it's not, you know, it doesn't look fake. It's got to stay real uh, in the way we're shooting. Uh, talk about chasing light, Josh. I, the times that I felt like, if I got to get that sunset, I may be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Did you ever have that adventure where you're rushing and chasing light? Oh, no <laughs> question about it. Uh, and I think every photographer uh, has those years where they're driven by this frenetic desire to capture the most epic light possible. Uh, but a funny thing that I've discovered over the last few years is that you get a lot better pictures and you have a lot more fun and you're way more relaxed in the field if instead of chasing, chasing, chasing all the time, you let the landscape and the light tell you the story that it wants to tell you. Mm -hmm. You might go out with this expectation of, I'm going to take the world's most epic, wide angle, in your face, foreground, sky blowing up picture over Grand Teton that anybody's ever seen. But if you get there on a a rainy day or a clear day, that photo literally is not going to happen. I mean, there's two ways you can approach that. You can throw your camera down and stomp off angry, or you can say, what actually is happening right now? And let the light tell you what you should be shooting. Mm -hmm. And I think that brings a lot more enjoyment, and you, have a, you just end up with a lot more keeper photos, because mm -hmm. uh, you get to explore this relationship instead of pushing your preconceived expectations onto the landscape. Mandy, talk a little bit about the quality of light for you and what's important and what are you looking for? Um, I, I mean, I think when you see something beautiful, you just, you feel it. You instantly, you're just like, that's what I want, that's what I want to shoot. And like Josh said, you, landscape is hard because you have, there's so many elements that you have no control over. You don't get to control your light. You don't get to control the placement of a lot of objects. Sometimes there's something in the way you've got to work around, and so you've got to be flexible. And um, I think a lot of landscape is just waiting, honestly. And I love that about it. It's such a slow, 
I used to shoot a lot of events, and when you're shooting an event, a wedding, a party, whatever, it's like on the ball, you're capturing every single moment, you've got to be always on it. But in landscape, set it up, put it on your tripod, and you just wait. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what puts you in that picture, and I love that about landscape photography. And then in an instant, you have this one minute of this like adrenaline rush, oh my gosh, here it is, it's, it's here. And then you take it, and then it's like, ah, that was awesome. <laughs> hurry up and wait. <laughs> yeah, hurry up and wait. I mean, that's um, a lot Mike, of you talked yeah. a little bit about night landscape before. Yep. I, again, I think it's one of these places people have this misperception that it's just one picture that happens. Yeah. Talk yeah. about how you prepare for a night landscape shot where you're photographing the aurora, the beautiful stars. What goes into it to make the shot, and what do you do after the fact? Because I know it just doesn't seem to happen easily. No, no you know, it's, uh, I think I've got two shots, the aurora shot and the Milky Way with the lava shot. Um, both of those are uh, completely different scenarios. The, uh, the uh, Aurora shot, you know, I nerded out. I paid attention to the space weather, seeing what was going on with the, the solar winds, and said, all right, you know, looked at the weather. It's actually going to be clear. Went out to a dark area up in Banff National Park up in Canada and waited and waited and waited and then got doubtful, then got impatient. and. About 2 o'clock in the morning, I was like, okay, this isn't going to happen. And sometimes, you know, like Josh said, you got to realize when things aren't going to happen. But then also, it's this battle because you want it to happen so badly, but, you know, eventually you have to go to bed. Um, and so I gave it like 30 more minutes. And I kid you not, within that 30 minutes, the sky just ripped open. The aurora was dancing like I've never seen before. And uh, so that's where patience paid off. Right. Um, and then, you know, with it's such a love-hate battle with landscape photography because it's like you want to shoot this amazing sunset and then you want to shoot the stars right after so you need the clouds for the landscape and then you need them to go away and so when i did the uh, milky way lava shot i went out there to go shoot uh, with never in a million years that i think i was gonna shoot the milky way lava i went out there to shoot uh the sunset and we had absolutely no clouds whatsoever it was a blank sky and i had hiked 13, mil uh, 13 miles on kilauea for an empty sky. <laughs> well, then all of a sudden my mind started going, all right, well, you know what? You have an empty sky. Well, now you got stars. And uh, so I waited. I was like, maybe I'll get the stars with the lava. And then I noticed the Milky Way. I was like, well, that's pretty fascinating. Well, maybe I'll get that. Oh, well, that's Mars, and that's Venus, and then that's the moon. And then everything all came together perfectly there. So I think having that flexibility, um, it really allowed me to, great, to capture a great night shot mm -hmm. when I wasn't planning on it. Um, Josh, you mentioned before isolating with a 7200. What would your standard package of lenses be when you go out to shoot? So I always try to make sure I'm covered from 14 millimeters to 200 millimeters, uh, no matter where I am. If I'm in the front country, then I bring everything I own, including two to 500, so I can do those super telephoto moonshots. But if I'm, in, uh, if I'm out backpacking, then of course I'm trying to save as much weight as possible. So I'll bring a 14 to 24, 18 to 35, 50 millimeter prime, and a 70 to 200 f4, mm -hmm. and that Andy, serves me pretty well. What would your package of, uh, of lenses be? Really similar. I have a couple different lenses. Again, same way, I like to cover the entire range, um, but I love the 24 to 70 as well. So I do the 14 to 24, 24 to 70, 70 200. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, if I'm not backpacking, I've got the 200 uh, to 500, which I love. But um, if I'm backpacking, that might not come. Right. Uh, Mike, I want you to tell everybody a little bit about the recent story you did in Hawaii mm -hmm. on volcanoes. And what, what do you have to, <laughs> it seems like a dangerous thing to do, but what do you, what, what was your intent with all of that when you went out there to photograph what was going on when the volca volcanoes became active? Yeah, so uh, for those that don't know, I recently spent uh, the end of May and mid-June last year out on the big island of Hawaii documenting the uh, uh, Kilauea eruption in the lower east rift zone. And uh, it's kind of a two-part thing because for me, uh, I'm fascinated, obviously, as well as all of us, by nature. And I've uh, dealt with Kilauea before, so I knew, I knew as soon as it erupted, I was going to go back out there. But also, um, for me, it, it was this battle because, you know, there's the nerdy science part that's amazing. But here on the mainland, we weren't hearing much about it except for the first, you know, few days. Mm -hmm. And over 800 homes were lost, so there was a story to be told there, um, and not many people were covering that aspect of it. So I wanted to go out there and show, you know, this is what's really going on. And, uh, you know, there's a beauty to it, but also there's a devastation to it. 
Right. So tying those two together to kind of create a story that showed, yes, it is beautiful, but it is also this as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I worked with a couple of different things to do uh, fundraising to get money out there to help people kind of get back on their feet. And, you know, it's kind of like tornadoes as well. Without the images showing what is actually happening there, people don't realize just how bad it is. So the Kilauea uh, coverage was, you know, for, you know, showing people what was really going on there, but also, you know, the beauty of it as well. Yeah, and I thought uh, it, when you were posting, I thought it was really important that you were saying, hey, these pictures are beautiful, but just remember, there's a lot of devastation going on here, and you were documenting that. And, yeah. Um, always by land. It looks like you do use helicopter. To how, I see some shots from very high angles. How are you making those? Yeah, so um, I love getting up in the air. Right. So I think... Uh, it's an absolutely wonderful way to see the world we live in. Uh, so when people in airplanes, they don't have the window seat. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Um, but getting up in a helicopter and uh, shooting landscapes from there, uh, it just opens up a s totally different view, uh, so many different compositions. There's a pano somewhere in the slideshow that I shot over the island of Kauai out of a helicopter. It's an eight-image panorama that I just put, it on, put the camera on uh, motor drive and just shot as many as I could so I wouldn't get the rotor in the way. Mm -hmm. But um, that's a view that most people will never, ever see. And you could have, you know, 100 photographers down on the boats getting in the same shot, but you get up in the air, all of a sudden you're getting a unique angle that nobody's gotten before. Right. And there's also an image from Iceland looking down on this area of water, this image right here. Right. And it's in the highlands of Iceland. From the ground, you would never see those turquoise yeah, the colors. The geometric shapes and patterns are phenomenal. Exactly. So getting up in a helicopter, looking straight down, looking out, uh, it really opens up the door for some creativity. Mm -hmm. So, Mandy, some of you people may be from Las Vegas and some of you from our other parts of the world or the country. Talk about your favorite places to go and have you shot around here. So... Give me your bucket list places or oh, your favorite places. What haven't you done? But let's start off with wh what's your favorite place? Where's your favorite place to shoot? Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, I obviously, I love the mountains. So, I mean, anywhere with gorgeous mountains is top of my list. Uh, mainly, it's been, for me, Colorado and Wyoming mm -hmm. that have the best mountains. Um, but all the, I mean, the U.S. has some diverse landscape. And I really just love seeing all the different types of areas. Um, and there's a lot of stuff I haven't done. I mean, I live in my trailer and I travel full time and I still feel like it will take me 50 years to see all of the US. Like there's, there's some, and to give, do it justice too, you know, you can't go somewhere for a weekend and really say, say you saw the place. Um, so just exploring as much as you can in the diver diverse landscape from, you know, our, our kind of rainforest to desert to mountains. We have so much. Um, so I really like the mountains. Around here, um, Death Valley is a very quick drive. And I'm actually heading out there tomorrow because I can't be in this area and not go shoot something. But even really in, you know, people always say, ah, oh, you're going to Las Vegas. And they just think the Strip. They literally, a lot of people are very ignorant to landscape what here, right. is it, Las Vegas. And yeah, um, Kendrick and I come out here and we go out to Red Rocks. There's a lot of climbing, there's a lot of hiking, there's a lot of really beautiful areas, the Valley of Fire. Right. Um, and then, of course, we're going to head out to Death Valley, but there's some great hiking and, you know, it's, it's not all gambling here. <laughs> so, um, Josh, uh, can you remember the place you stood that stood out the most for any photo you've taken, any landscape picture you've taken? Not trying to put you on the spot or anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, there are so many amazing moments that you get to experience as a landscape photographer. And, and I think sometimes we maybe get a little bit spoiled because of that. Um, and I, I know that I could point to any one of the photos that I'm going to show in my presentation and say, this was a lifetime highlight moment. Uh, but the one that's popping into my head right now is Milford Sound, New Zealand. And we were there during a, a rainstorm. It's one of the rainiest places on the planet. And as this rainstorm started to clear, the sun was at just the perfect angle that it shined up the fjord of Milford Sound. And these very distinct three beams of light came up and hit this wall of rain that was falling in the sound. And I actually have the, the photo uh, coming up in my presentation. And it went from gray to this incredible display of color and light and drama in a split second. And that one was definitely fused into the old memory banks. Mm -hmm. If you guys want to hang, I just want to tell you that most 
uh, after all the panel discussions, we followed with the specific photographer that hit that genre. So I'm looking at the schedule. We have Joshua Cripps coming up next. There's a woman coming in. She's flown in and got in late last night who makes amazing wildlife photos, uh, Melissa Grew. And then we're going to close out with Mike um, uh, to, to end CES. We really want to load it up towards the end with some really dynamic, lovely, beautiful pictures. And you can go back and see Mandy's program because everything that we're doing, including this panel, uh, in the way of presentations will be up on Nikon Live. So if you want to grab the schedule, it has the URL. Um, uh, as we wind down, I've, I've talked about this in every panel, is the importance of social and getting your pictures out there, not just to drive your business, but to bring awareness. Um, we'll start with you, Mike, and we'll work our way back over to Josh, and then we're going to clear the stage, Josh, and you're going to take over. You're going to run with this. But talk a little bit about social. we got your social handles up there that we've been rotating through. Um, and I see, again, you guys straight up use your name. So best advice, don't throw out yeah. something out there nobody's going to know or recognize you with. I learned that a long time ago. I think the first name of a business card I had, Blue Panda Photography, and someone looks like, what the heck is a Blue Panda? I don't know. I made it up. So straightforward, right? But talk to me about social. What's your best platform, and how do you do this? Yeah, I, uh, social's huge. I rely on Instagram, Facebook quite a bit. Um, it's just a good way to be inspired by others and inspire them as well. Uh, you know, we mentioned earlier a little bit of you know research into spots. So, you know, I was in Hawaii uh, last night and uh, searching hashtag Kauai, seeing what people are posting, and using those hashtags to you know find spots. Uh, and talk to maybe locals that live there and be like, hey, because let's be real, locals know the best spots. Mm -hmm. So uh, social is huge. And then, you know, I teach workshops. So I use that to, um, you know, inspire others to come on workshops and to, to show them what they'll see and what they'll learn as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's extremely powerful. Mandy? Um, yeah, exactly the same. It is the most powerful tool for an artist running their own business how do you advertise? I mean, this is what we do. It's, it's, um, so one, it's a platform for advertising our business, our workshops, what we do. I think that for me, it also, I mean, it is the best platform to share images and video and to reach people to inspire them. But I don't just share pictures to inspire people, like, or I don't just share pictures to toot my own horn, they look, look at this pretty pictures. I do it to inspire people. Mm -hmm. And so getting the feedback from people when somebody comments or messages or says, wow, this, you know, this picture really made my day, I was having a bad day, this was the best thing to see. If I get a comment like that, it just like, it reminds me why I'm doing what I'm doing, is people can tell me, oh man, you know, this, my dad went, took me there when I was five. This picture means a lot to me. And I'll just be like, yeah, I knew I took that picture for a reason. So it's really kind of self-affirming for me, too. Have you guys ever held back and not told the location because you didn't want to share that location so someone else Maybe. didn't make that picture? <laughs> I think that's more of a not geotagging a location because you want it to yourself. Because to be real, everybody's going to find it sooner or later. Right. Yeah. Right. But it's more of a, a protection thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll tell somebody if I know that that person's going to go there and be respectful, Sure, here's how you get to it. But if I look at their Instagram and they've been disrespectful to places and, and breaking, breaking laws and stuff, no. There are some beautiful, beautiful places that are now closed and you can't even go to because people have disrespected them so much. So That's, that's a great point. So respecting the landscape yeah. is something really huge. Josh, as we roll into your program, where, where, where do people go look at your work outside of, I guess, uh, Instagram or... So my, my favorite platform uh, for sharing my work is actually my website, uh, because there you can see the images in big living color. Uh, Instagram is fantastic for creating community and meeting other photographers and engaging with people. Uh, but I also love YouTube. I have an educational YouTube channel. We're just about to roll over 300,000 subscribers on it. Uh, and I find that to be an awesome place to help people enjoy and appreciate and understand the world of landscape photography. Oh, that's amazing. Well, like every other panel, I wish we had more time. You guys, uh, again, this is the kind of stuff I love to look at because, and appreciate because I don't do it. And that's why I live vicariously through your travels. And I think I've kind of busted you a couple of times, Mike, about places you are. Well, I just came in from Hawaii. All right, well, I just came in from Long Island. So, <laughs> um, but I, I think your work is brilliant. I, I enjoy looking at it. And I can't thank you enough for giving us uh, time 
and sharing some of your insights. Again, please follow these photographers. But what we're going to do now is we're going to slide these chairs out. And Josh, uh, we're going to set you up to uh, do your nice 30-minute program. Again, Melissa Grew, great wildlife photographer, epic, is going to come up and speak. And then we're going to close out CES 2019 with Mike. All right, so thank you guys. Thank you guys for thank tuning in. Thank Let's transition into Josh Cripps.